everybody, Jade here. I'm at the Eye Telescope Observatory in Siding Spring, Australia. And today's video is about one of the greatest riddles in astronomy, which took over 60 years to solve. It's about a mystery surrounding these lines. We'll use the amazing equipment around us today to help us recreate the story and see if we can solve the pieces of the puzzle ourselves. It all started in 1864, when an English astronomer named Sir William Huggins looked through a telescope very similar to the one we have here. He described the night like this. I directed the telescope for the first time to a planetary nebula in Draco, which today is known as the Cat's Eye Nebula. After a few moments of hesitation, I put my eye to the spectroscope. Was I not about to look into a secret place of creation? No spectrum such as I expected, a single bright line only. Huggins was extremely excited by what he saw, and here's why. See, what Huggins saw were spectral lines. And every element on the periodic table has its own unique signature in the spectral lines. So how do we get spectral lines? Well, we need a spectrograph. And this is a very rudimentary spectrograph. Uh, it's just the basics. So what we need is a light source. In this case, it's a fluorescent light emitting through a collecting lens, uh, a slit, which is effectively two metal plates with a very small diameter between them, making the light a line of light. It comes through a collimating lens and then it hits the diffraction grating. The diffraction grating fans light out into the spectrum, so that rainbow. That light is then emitted into, in this case, a lens, but in a research grade spectrograph, it will be cameras. So what was so exciting about this single line that Huggins saw was that it didn't match any of the spectral lines of any of the known elements at the time. The only conclusion was that he discovered a new element that didn't exist on Earth. Now this is where the riddle begins. As exciting as the discovery of a new element was, there were some problems. For one, it was speculated that nebulium should be a fairly light element. This is because the list of elements found in nebulae at the time included only substances of low atomic weight, hydrogen, helium, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. However, the table of elements was very well understood at the time, and there didn't seem to be room for another light element. So the riddle was there was scientific evidence of a new element, but it didn't fit in anywhere with the current model of science. This puzzle remained unsolved for over 60 years until an American grad student, Ira Bowen, came along. Bowen knew about this riddle, as did most astronomers at the time, and in 1927 he happened to stumble across a book at the library. Little did he know this moment would change the course of astronomy. The book was simply a textbook called Astronomy, written by a prominent astronomer, Russell Dugan. Dugan was talking about the riddle of nebulium and he speculated that the nebula lines may be emitted only in a gas of very low density. This would happen, for example, if it took a relatively long time for an atom to get into the right state to emit them, and if a collision with another atom in this interval prevented the completion of the process. In such a case, it might require a great thickness of the very rarefied gas to emit these lines strongly enough to be visible. Even though he didn't fully grasp them, these words struck a chord with Bowen. A seed had been planted in his mind. What it would grow into, he didn't yet know. Weeks went by, then one night as Bowen was preparing for bed, the answer suddenly came to him. He quickly dressed and rushed back to his office in tremendous excitement. Now before I tell you Bowen's revelation, I thought it would be fun to see if we could try and figure out the riddle ourselves. I'm going to give you all the pieces of information you need as clues and afterwards I want you to pause the video and see if you can solve it yourself. Just a warning, these clues aren't like regular clues in that they contain a lot of science and could be considered quite advanced, but hey, that's why you're here, right? Let's see if we would have made good astronomy detectives. Listen carefully to these four clues. Clue number one, spectral lines are formed by photon emission. We've talked about how spectral lines are used to identify elements, but we haven't talked about why they happen in the first place. The way spectral lines are formed has a lot to do with the structure of atoms. You may know that atoms consist of a nucleus in the middle and electrons whizzing around it. This isn't exactly the whole story because quantum physics likes to complicate things, but this model is good enough for our purposes, so we're going to use it. 
Now, a key characteristic of atoms is that their electrons exist in these fixed orbitals around the nucleus. So an electron can be here or here, but not anywhere in between. They simply can't exist there. This has to do with the quantum nature of physics. It's kind of like when you drink coffee. There are discrete states of focused, hyperfocused, anxiety, and hyperventilation, and you can't seem to land anywhere in between. The point is that the electrons need to exist in these discrete orbitals. Now, electrons can also jump between orbitals. When an electron is given some energy, it'll jump to a higher orbital. One way an electron can get energy is if incoming light, or a photon, hits it, and it absorbs the energy of the photon. A characteristic of the universe is that it's kind of lazy. So atoms like to be in the lowest energy state possible, which means after some time, the electron will relax back to a lower orbital. Because it was transferred energy in the form of a photon to jump up, it releases energy as a photon on the way down. The released photon has the exact frequency which corresponds to the energy between the orbital gaps. And this is what is collected by the spectrograph and produces spectral lines, as different energy level photons produce different colors of light. So why does each element have a unique set of spectral lines? Well, the atoms of each element all have different signature energy spacings between their orbitals. Because the emitted photons have a frequency which corresponds to the energy spacings, they will have different frequencies depending on which element they came from. These frequencies are all collected by the spectrograph and we get these lovely spectral lines. So the green line that Huggins saw would be coming from photon emissions from an element in the nebula. So now you know how spectral lines are formed and we have our first clue to help us solve the puzzle. Clue number two. A photon is not always emitted when an electron relaxes to a lower energy state. We just talked about how a photon can excite an electron, but electrons can also be excited by atoms that bump into them. Instead of absorbing the atom, there's a transfer of kinetic energy. This is called excitation by collision. Electrons can also relax down to lower orbitals by collision with other atoms too. Sometimes an electron in a higher energy state can transfer some energy to an incoming electron by bumping into it. Because it's given some of its energy away, it relaxes down. In these cases, a photon is not emitted. Instead, the excess energy is transferred to the free atom as momentum. The key idea here is that a photon is not emitted when an electron relaxes to a lower energy state from a collision. Clue number three. Metastable states. The most stable state for an electron to be in is what's called the ground state. This is the state with the lowest amount of energy, again, because the universe is lazy. Mm -hmm. So if an electron is in the ground state, it's pretty happy just chilling out, and it's not going to move unless there's some kind of stimulus like a photon or collision. When it is given a stimulus, it can move into a higher orbital, and because it wants to relax back down and doesn't really like being there too much, we call this an unstable state. It's not going to be in this state for very long. And by not very long, I mean typically less than a microsecond. Then there are the metastable states, which are kind of stable and kind of not. The best way to think about them is like this. Imagine a ball at the bottom of a valley, and just up from the valley, there's another smaller, shallower valley. The ball is in the most stable state in the lowest valley, as it needs a pretty big push to get out of it. However, if the ball is somehow pushed to the second valley, it's pretty stable in that it won't move on its own, but it also won't take much of a push for it to get back down to the lower valley. So it's kind of stable, but not super stable. It's metastable. An unstable state would be something like this tiny cliff sticking out. The ball sure isn't going to last very long there and will probably fall down just from gravity. So the ball stays longest in the ground state, shorter in the metastable state, and even shorter in the unstable state. Likewise, the energy orbitals of atoms have the stable ground state, unstable states, and metastable states. And the electrons can stay in the metastable states much longer than in the unstable states. They usually spontaneously emit and release a photon after seconds or even hours, which is a lot longer than the less than a microsecond the unstable states last. These metastable states are usually in lower energy orbitals of the atom than the unstable states, and electrons are usually excited into them by collisions rather than photons. Even though they take a long time to spontaneously emit, 
a collision with another atom can knock an electron out of a metastable state. So that's our third clue. Metastable states take a long time for an electron to get out of spontaneously, but can be knocked out by a collision. The final clue, clue number four. The atmosphere of Earth is much denser than the atmosphere of a nebula. This is the final piece of the puzzle. On Earth, our atmosphere has over 10 to the power of 19 atoms per cubic centimeter. I know it doesn't look like our atmosphere is filled with so much stuff, but remember that atoms are small, crazy small. Now the density of nebulae is between 1,000 to 10,000 atoms per cubic centimeter, which is barely anything compared to Earth, right? The density in a nebula is purer than any vacuum ever produced on Earth. On Earth, particles collide 10 to the power of 19 times per second. So that's the final clue. The density of atoms on Earth is crazily large compared to the density of atoms in the nebulae. Now let's recap the riddle and clues, then we'll pause the video and try and solve it for ourselves. A spectral line was found in space that does not correspond to any known element ever seen on Earth. The only conclusion is that it's a new element, nebulium, which does not exist on Earth. However, there was no space in the current scientific model for a new element with the properties of nebulium. How could this be? Well, we heard four clues to help us figure it out. Clue one, spectral lines are formed by photon emission. Clue two, a photon is not always emitted when an electron relaxes to a lower energy state. Clue three, a collision with an atom can knock an electron out of a metastable state. And clue four, the atmosphere on Earth is much, 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 much denser than the atmosphere in a nebulae. Pause the video now and see if you can solve the riddle yourself. If you need to look at any of the clues again, I've put the timestamps on the screen so you can go and look at them again. So pause the video and write your answers in the comments below. So how did you go? Let's see Bowen's solution to see how yours compares. Bowen came to the conclusion that the unknown lines were in fact caused by a known element just in a different atmosphere. As Dugan said, in a gas of very low density, like a nebula. On Earth, if an electron is excited into a metastable state, because there are 10 to the power of 19 collisions per second, it won't be long until it's hit again by another atom. Remember that spontaneous emission from a metastable state can take seconds to hours, but on Earth, there are 10 to the power of 19 collisions per second. When electrons are de-excited by collisions with atoms, the excess energy is carried away with the atom instead of being emitted as a photon. Therefore, in the Earth's atmosphere, we rarely ever see a spectral line produced by a metastable state. In a nebula, however, it's a totally different story. Because of the low density of atoms in a nebula, if an electron happens to get into a metastable state, it has a lot of time to spontaneously emit, as there isn't much probability of it bumping into another atom. Therefore, a photon is released when the electron relaxes and we get these spectral lines from the metastable transition. The signature energy gap of these atoms corresponds to a beautiful green color of light. So nebulium didn't exist after all. It was actually the metastable state photon from oxygen. These were given the name forbidden lines because they can't be observed anywhere on Earth. Now just quickly, Christian, an astronomer from the Siding Spring Observatory is going to say a few last words about forbidden lines. Well, we've talked about the oxygen three lines being forbidden lines. And that has been the Bowen mystery, which you have understood is now solved. However, these lines are not only spectral lines, they actually give beautiful colors of our universe. And that's what these telescopes at Siding Spring are there for. Let's take a close look here at one of these telescopes. So you can see a typical telescope consists of what we call an optical tube assembly. That's where the reflector is. A large camera that is cooled and a huge filter wheel which actually contains color filters. So these color filters are typically red, green, and blue. And in addition to that, you have these so-called emission line filters, which we also call narrowband filters. And they are oxygen-3, which is our forbidden line. And now you'll see it all in color. And the sulfur line, as well as the hydrogen alpha lines. And that is what makes these beautiful pictures that you often see with a Hubble telescope or online in other beautiful sites. 
So that's the story of one of the greatest astronomy riddles in history. A huge thank you to the people of Siding Spring Observatory for helping me make this awesome video. Also a huge thank you to my patrons on Patreon who these videos would not be possible without. Let me know how you did in the comments with the riddle and um, I'll see you in the next video. Bye!